So to start with, what I'd like to do is to share with you some of the goals that I have for the training course itself. So this is over the two-day course. The first one is to have a sense about what IPT is. So to understand the model and to understand what makes IPT different than cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, or acceptance and commitment therapy, or dialectical behavioral therapy, or behavioral activation, or any of the other ones uh, that you're familiar with already, probably. So to really define well what IPT is and how you would apply it in a clinical setting. The second thing is to have some familiarity with IPT techniques. I'll be showing you some videotape about that specifically. And in conjunction with some other goals I have, I'd like to suggest to you that some of the things we'll be talking about, and especially some of the tools, will be helpful for you even if you don't do IPT. I don't think IPT is a one-size-fits-all. I think it's a good idea to have a lot of different tools in your toolbox. My goal here is not to convert you into an IPT therapist. It's really to help you to have that as an additional tool so that if you come across a patient, and I think there will be many, but when you come across patients who would really respond well to IPT, you know how to do it well. But also to use some of the techniques and tools we'll be talking about in IPT in other kinds of approaches. Good example, the interpersonal inventory, the interpersonal circle that we'll be talking about a little bit later this morning, I think works really well with almost every single patient you might work with, even if you're doing behavioral activation, say. The principles we'll be talking about with IPT formulation, a biopsychosocial, cultural, spiritual formulation, I think is a very nice way to understand what's going on with patients, irrespective of what kind of therapeutic approach you're using. So I think some of the tools and techniques we'll be talking about will be helpful to you, even if you're using different approaches. I'd like you to have some ability to conduct IPT when we finish, certainly not at an expert level, but there's no reason, literally, when we finish up tomorrow afternoon, that you can't take a break on Sunday and start doing IPT on Monday morning. One of the things I'd really like to encourage those of you who are coming from programs uh, together is to do some peer supervision and encourage one another. Don't lose the momentum that you'll have built up after we finish tomorrow. But there's no reason why you should not be able to go and conduct IPT with patients on Monday. And then finally, if you're interested, there are some opportunities for additional training. Uh, I'll talk about those later tomorrow. So if you're interested in supervision and certification, uh, and I especially want to put a bug in your ear about the ISIPT meeting. We'll be having the international meeting, fifth international meeting for IPT, right here in Iowa City. It'll be in June of 2013, so a year, a year and several months from now. And be delighted to have especially a strong student participation in that as well. So what I'd like to start with is theory. And I want to share with you some ideas about what IPT is. I think there's really three ways that one might define IPT. The first one is pretty obvious. It's interpersonally based. The second one is that it's time limited and acute treatment. And then the third one is it's non-transferential, typically in the interventions that are used in IPT. So let me go through each of those and give you a sense about what I mean on a practical level. And that's one of the things I'll be trying to do throughout the entire course is practical application. One of the things that we've gotten feedback from many, many years has been people like to see it being done. The didactic information is helpful as background, but people want to see IPT being done. They want to know how to apply it on a practical level. So I'm going to try and avoid as much as possible simply giving you platitudes or PowerPoint slides and talk about how you actually do it. So let's start with the first one. IPT is interpersonally based. That's obvious from the title. Uh, it focuses on three different specific interpersonal problem areas. One of those is role transitions. The second one is grief and loss issues. The third one is interpersonal disputes. What makes IPT different than the other therapies is that that interpersonal area, the interpersonal areas, are specific foci. That's what you talk about primarily. In cognitive behavioral therapy, you probably would talk about interpersonal issues. Nearly everybody who comes to therapy has interpersonal problems. If you're doing long-term psychoanalytic work, you're going to be talking about interpersonal issues. If you're doing behavioral activation, interpersonal issues as well. But that's not the primary focus. If you're doing cognitive behavioral therapy, your primary focus, what you want to change, what you're targeting, is cognitions, schema. You certainly would talk about interpersonal issues, but that's not your primary focus. If you're doing behavioral activation, your primary focus is behavioral change. 
It's not change in interpersonal relationships as a primary focus, although you'd still talk about that. And if you're doing long-term psychoanalytic psychotherapy, your focus, your primary goal is to change intrapsychic functioning, to help people use more adaptive defense mechanisms, to help bolster their ego strength. That's what you're focused on. Of course you talk about interpersonal issues, but that's not the primary focus. It is an IPT. That's what makes it different, one of the things. Conversely, what that also means is that you can talk about other kinds of things in IPT as long as you don't lose that focus. So, for example, behavioral activation techniques can certainly be used in IPT. So if you have somebody who would really benefit from something simple like dietary modification, exercise, there's absolutely no reason why you can't use those techniques within the rubric of IPT. My suggestion, in order to keep it more aligned with that interpersonal focus, would be to think of ways you can do that to encourage social support and interpersonal interaction. Concrete example, if I'm working with somebody within the IPT framework and trying to be adherent to that treatment, IPT, typically I would suggest doing exercise with somebody else. So instead of, why don't you go for a walk, or why don't you go down to the gym, who could you find to go for a walk with? Who can you help engage you in that process? Can you find a friend that you can spend some time with doing an activity together? Or if I'm talking about dietary modification on IPT, it's going to be, who can help you to do that? Who can you get support from to change that diet? So it's interpersonally focused, but there's no reason why you can't use some of the other techniques from other therapies. As a matter of fact, I think with more depressed patients, some of those behavioral activation techniques in particular are very helpful. In IPT, just to call a spade a spade, we talk about cognitions. Don't call them that in IPT. In IPT, we call them expectations, but they're really cognitions, to be honest. It's just a difference in terminology. So talking about expectations really is a cognitive set, but that's not the primary focus. It's certainly helpful in talking about interpersonal relationships and talking about grief and loss issues, transitions and disputes, but that's not the primary focus. It's the interpersonal relationships and communication that really is the focus in IPT. There's a lot of overlap, especially with the techniques. There's a lot of things that are similar between the therapies, but they are different. The primary focus in IPT is on interpersonal relationships and social support. The primary focus in cognitive behavioral therapy is cognitions and schema. In psychodynamic psychotherapy, it's on intrapsychic functioning and defense mechanisms. And if you're doing acceptance and commitment therapy, it's on values. There are differences in the primary focus. Let's talk about the second one, the time-limited aspect of IPT. And this is actually where it does share some similarities with most of the empirically validated treatments. So let me share a metaphor with you. In IPT, I often like to think about the way that we would conduct therapy as being similar to a family practice model. So imagine, for example, you've got a really bad cough and a fever, and you go to your family practice doc, and your doctor does an exam, maybe does an x-ray, maybe some lab tests, probably gives you an antibiotic medication, that your physician says, come back and see me in two or three, well, probably doesn't say two or three days in our treatment system, but ideally would say, come back and see me in two or three days. And then, if you were doing well, would say, come back a week later, and at that point, your doctor would never say, we're terminating. We're done. Don't come back again. Never, you know, we're finished. The primary care doctor says, come back six months later. I want to make sure you're still doing okay. If that cough comes back, come back in and see me. Give me a call. Oh, and don't forget to come back for your regular physical exam next year. As a matter of fact, why don't we go ahead and schedule that now? The primary care physician has an ongoing relationship, treating acute crises and providing some maintenance care. That's similar to IPT. There's no reason to terminate therapy. I did a very careful literature review, and there's absolutely no data whatsoever supporting the fact that termination leads to better outcomes. As a matter of fact, the exact opposite is true. We'll take a look at the data a little bit later this morning. Um, But just to give you a brief overview, we have crystal clear data that uh, Axis I disorders like depression and anxiety disorders are remitting and recurring disorders. We have crystal clear evidence that maintenance treatment helps prevent those episodes from occurring. There's absolutely no reason to terminate treatment, none. On the other hand, 
there is reason to what, do what I would can call conclude treatment and shift to a maintenance phase because many people don't need to be in therapy forever and ever. Shouldn't be. We have a long waiting list amongst other things. But in order to encourage independence and social support outside of therapy, which is what IPT is all about, there is reason actually to keep it relatively short term. So what I'd like to suggest to you is what I would call a dosing range of IPT. And that's going to be somewhere between about four or six to 20 sessions, give or take. This is where your therapeutic judgment really comes into play. Very simply, if you have somebody who comes in with a focal problem, no psychiatric history, mild depression, four or five sessions probably is adequate, especially if they have a good social support network. If somebody's got personality disorders, uh, maladaptive attachment style, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, history, perhaps some suicide attempts, you're going to be looking at longer treatment. It's still going to be time limited within that dosing range. And in both cases, you're probably going to want to think very seriously, especially the latter one, about doing some maintenance treatment. But it's a dosing range that comes to a conclusion, not a termination, with some kind of maintenance treatment to follow.